So anyways, I saw the gorgeous yesterday. They're uh, <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it's a, it's an impressive thing. Um, so thanks for everybody. Um, so what I want to talk today about is Maran fermions. And this is kind of a weird talk in the sense that I'll be showing data that's not given by that's not taken by me. So um, I don't have this validity. <laughs> but you know. But you put your name on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so again, yeah, I have test for this. It's a joke. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, you know, just, just the right hand, not, not my life. But my <laughs> so, um, um, but before I do that, I want to show you, I want to do some uh, theory and, you know, it's simple stuff. But um, what I want to do is show you that my Arana fermions are, are uh, prevalent in this stuff, really. We just have a hard time finding them. They're everywhere. Um, uh, the second thing that I want to show you is that in these experiments that that have been performed at Princeton, something more, much more interesting can happen, and interaction effects can be um, potentially looked at, and that's kind of what we're working on, due to some weird symmetry that exists in these materials. So I'm going to basically build on Abu Hassan's talk. And just ask, give you a reason why an odd number of bands when you super make them superconducting will always have Majorana fermions. Okay? So, since in yesterday's talk it was immediately shown, um, you know, the superconducting. Hamiltonian was written down. Um, I'm just going to quickly go over that. So the Hamiltonian that I'm going to be using is just a kinetic term. Its form doesn't matter. So, but you know, this is the form. You can. This is the you know an expansion of the form. But consider this to be a some kinetic energy. Okay. C k dagger C k. And since I have an odd number of bands, I'm here picking one band. In the slide that I'll be showing, there's actually five. So by the way, these are the people that I'm working with. This, there's actually five bands, just like in that, because iron has, the material is iron, and has, has um, d orbitals. But basically, the, the main story is that they're all spin split. So these bands, you see I don't put any spin on them because otherwise they will double. And I want to add a superconducting term, which for the purposes of today I'll add it as just a um, some sort of a, a BDG pairing. And can somebody tell me what this yes? Sorry, are there six bands in that picture? So each so each of these things are doubly, there's the double degeneracy here. So these are M. Huh. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and expected. There's another pointer on the thing you can try. On where? Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> That's also interesting and expected. Okay, so these, so these are plus minus two, these are plus minus one. These are doubly generated. This is the only one that's singly generated. So basically, the moral of the story is whatever orbitals you'd be using, and that's the crucial thing, whatever orbital, that's a very good question, whatever orbitals you'd be using, when you spin split them, the atom has two L, if it's an orbital of angular momentum L, the atom has two L plus one bands. So they're always odd once you spin split them. It doesn't matter which orbital you're using, and that's the which are the five? crucial thing, the D orbitals. What's blue and what's red? I think that's the question. The blue and the blue and red are spin up and spin down. So just look at R. Look, so one, two, three, four, five. Okay? So but for the purposes of explaining it, I'm gonna explain it with one band. Okay? And and can somebody tell me what this needs to be in order for you know the Hamiltonian? not to be zero, or this superconducting term not to be zero. This needs to be even or odd in k. Odd in k. 
Okay, so that's the P wave that um, 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 Abel Hassan was speaking yesterday about, um, but I'm going to keep it generic. And <coughs> this Hamiltonian has a U1 symmetry corresponding to each CJ. You can gauge it, but for now I'm going to take it as a global U1 CJ because this comes C dagger, C dagger. This Hamiltonian breaks this symmetry, right? And it breaks exactly to what was said before, because if I just do C dagger, C dagger, I'll get e to the 2i. But there's a value of theta for which the symmetry still remains. What are, what are those two values? So 0 and pi. So I still have, so this is u1, and I still have this symmetry, which is z2. OK? So the superconductor has a Z2 symmetry, which really is just particle number parity, so fermion parity. So in other words, if I start with a state of even fermion number, anything that I do with this Hamiltonian can't change the evenness of the fermion number because this, you know, it's got two fermions that acts, this got, you know, doesn't change the particle number, this changes by two the evenness or oddness of a state that I start with cannot change. These are good quantum numbers. What does this Hamiltonian do? <coughs> well, in order to be able to diagonalize this Hamiltonian, and that's important, I can't, there's no way I can write this. So normally the way we diagonalize things is we define a new spinner, psi k, dagger, some h. This is a single particle first quantized matrix, Hamiltonian, psi k. But there's no way of diagonalizing this Hamiltonian without, there's no way of doing this. You can just try to, you know, you, you have your choices. It's like CK, C minus K. You'll see you won't be able to reproduce this term. The only way you'll be able to reproduce this term is if your spinner is defined redundantly. And this is the BDG formalism. And this is what people call particle hole symmetry. It's not a symmetry. It's just a redundancy in the way you're using your Hilbert space to diagonalize your Hamiltonian. So the number of states hasn't changed. The number of operators hasn't changed. You're just diagonalizing in this weird space. And then what you find out of it is that you know, a particle momentum k is equal, at energy e is equal to an antiparticle at, or a hole, at momentum minus k at energy minus e. Okay. So this is particle hole, let's call it redundancy. I'll, I'll use the term symmetry, but it's an abuse of, of language. Okay. The next thing that I want to show is instead of is 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 that that um, this term, such a term, will gap my spectrum. So <coughs> if I do this, I can re-express this with the spinner as epsilon k minus epsilon of minus k delta delta star if delta is complex. OK? In this basis, sum over k, psi k dagger, psi k. So what this does, as was pointed out in yesterday's talk, is it takes the electron band, which was looking something like this, I can even put a cosine here to make it lattice, lattice, uh, oh, thank you so much. To make it um, lattice appropriate, it takes minus this band, there's a chemical potential here that I want to think of, it takes minus this band at minus k, so it flips it, okay? These are the holes, okay? They go into the this one, and now it, there's obviously the system now in this redundant, redundant um, uh, space. So if I just have this, if I don't have a superconducting term, this is just a redundant description. I can make the spinner even bigger and make, even, make it even more redundant. But the purpose of this is that now I can have scattering k to minus k, which will open a gap. OK? So this is a gapped superconductor.
Okay? And there's only two things that I can define my superconductor by, or the ground states of my superconductor by, and that's this good quantum number, which is Z2 fermion parity. So now I'm actually going to ask, by the way, what, are, what is the unit flux in a superconductor? Is it the unit flux that we all know, or half the unit flux? Half the unit flux, and that's going to be important. So I can insert pi fluxes. OK, it's allowed. So now I'm just going to build a strategy that will give you an argument that odd number of bands always have Majorana fermions at the end. The strategy is going to be the following. I'm going to start from the metal and only think of the metal. Okay? And I'm going to look at Fermi level here, Fermi level here, and Fermi level here. Okay? And then I'm going to characterize the property of the ground states of the metal. Okay? In these three, in these three um, um, uh, situations, upon fl or what happens to them upon flux insertion. Now, I could use particle number because the metal has particle number. But that would be a flawed thing to do because if I have a superconductor, I don't have particle number. So that symmetry would change. So what I am going to do is use just fermion parity, characterize these states or their change upon flux insertion by fermion parity. And then I know that once I add the gap, okay, once I add this term delta of k, that thing cannot change. Okay, because delta comes with c dagger c dagger. So it keeps the fermion parity of any function, okay? No matter how much I perturb it. All right. So I'm going to take a ring, put a 1D system of sites with operator CJ on a ring, and give them some kinetic energy, okay? Some k squared. OK? Now, <clears throat> first I'm going to look without flux insertion at periodic boundary conditions. OK? If I have periodic boundary conditions and translational invariance, what are the momenta that are allowed? So I'm going I'm to go to mental space. What are the momenta that are allowed? 2 pi, number of sites is n, times? times times the number where i goes from 0 to what n minus 1 okay let's plot these momentas momentum 0 is allowed it's here or just go from minus n over 2 to n over 2 plus 1 to n over 2 minus 1 same thing but you know i don't want to shift Okay, momentum zero is allowed. Then I have these coming in pairs. Okay? So, if the chemical potential is below the bandwidth or above the bandwidth, there's a state empty, the band is empty, or fully occupied. But if it, if it is mu is in the bandwidth, the ground state has what fermion parity? What's the ground state of the metal? I just fill up all these levels. What fermion parity has it got? Odd. That actually doesn't need to be the case, depending on the band structure you can actually have even fermion parity. What's fundamental is the change in fermion parity. Okay? So now what I'm going to do is take the same thing and insert flux pi in the middle. Okay? So if I insert flux pi, what's happening with my boundary conditions? From periodic they go to what is the momentum? 
changing? What are the allowed values of momentum? So k is now pi over n times what? Two i plus one. Thank you. Okay. So now if I do the same thing, you can clearly see that the zero is not going to be filled. Shit. Let's see. You get the message. Okay. What's so if mu is below or above? bandwidth, the state is empty or fully occupied, but if mu is in the bandwidth, so if mu sits somewhere here, what's the Fermi entirety? Huh? Even. Okay, so upon flux insertion, if my Fermi level of the metal is such that the band is fully empty, nothing happens upon flux insertion, right? The band is going to stay empty. However, if the chemical potential is in the bandwidth, something very interesting happens. The migrant state changes from even to fer odd fermion number upon flux insertion of pi. Yeah? Now why is this interesting? Well, because I said that now I can just add a gap to the system. Okay? And those properties wouldn't change because the term that adds the gap, this delta term, acts as C dagger, C dagger, so the fermion parity can't change. So the same properties will exist in the superconductor, in a gap system. Okay? That's extremely non trivial. If the Fermi level was in the bandwidth, and this is what um, um, I was calling the Weak pairing phase. Weak pairing phase is the Fermi level in the bandwidth. Okay? So if it's in the bandwidth, a gap superconductor changes fermion parity. The case graph that changes fermion parity upon flux insertion. Flux pi. Well, that's very weird. It's a gap system. Normal gap system shouldn't do anything because I, if I, if I insert things, okay. <coughs> and but since these two fermion parities are different, we know that if I insert flux pi, there's got to be somewhere a gap closing between, you know, one state is odd fermion parity, the other one is even. They're good quant numbers. There's got to be a gap closing somewhere in between. Moreover, I want to now claim that this property immediately implies the existence of Majorana fermions. Well, immediately, meaning 10 minutes. <laughs> Five minutes. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm not, go I'm not, well, it's, a, it's an argument again. It's, you know, if you want, you can poke holes to this argument because he, there I used translation invariance and here I want, but, but I think it's a beautiful argument. So, what, I want, what I'm going to do now is make the same process in the gap superconductor. So this is gap. Everything here is gap. F insert flux pi. But insert it, the way I can insert it is I can put on each bond here in the hopping term pi over n, right? But there's another way of doing it where I break translation invariance. And I insert all my flux <coughs> on one link at the end. So I insert. Like I go from flux zero to flux pi. So in other words, and I just do it on the hopping matrix element, on T. So I go from T, the hopping goes from, say, T, so that this, these were hoppings, T, T, call this T end. I'm just picking a link and doing it there. I go from T end, say positive, and after flux search, I go to T end negative. Okay? <coughs> so now this system has gone from has changed from your parity. There are several things that you have to 
uh, now the, 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 you have to notice. The bulk here is gapped. Okay? Everything is gapped in the bulk. I've made no transformation. I've made, I kept the bulk. I just haven't added flux on the bulk. I've added flux just on the edge. So nothing from here can actually contribute to this, to this changing ground state character. Hence, there must be something very close to the edge, okay, that 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 takes care of this transition between between you know even and odd fer fermion parity sectors. So there must be something. So first of all, that almost immediately, not immediately, but it, it's, a, it's a you know very strong hint that you have edge states. Why? Because I can make this T end greater than zero, but minuscule. And I can insert flux pi and make it smaller than zero, but also minuscule. So make this only t end much smaller than t. And the ground state will change parity. That's where the argument gets, you know, you need adiabatic continuation to the limit where t is equal to the, to the other t's. But let's forget about that. It's an argument. Okay? <coughs> so that means that there's got to be energy modes on the end that this t end couples. Okay? The bulk is gapped. So it means there must be, or in math notation, there exists, edge modes coupled by T end that do something. And this something is, you know, they go through a level crossing that do something, transition, since the bulk is gapped, I've chosen to do this only on one edge, upon flux insertion. Okay? All right. Now let me show you that these modes cannot be fermionic, complex fermionic. Why? Well, my bulk is gapped, so the spectrum, I have lost translation, say I lose translation invariance if I put this Tn different than T. My spectrum looks something like this. It's a superconductor, so it's got particle hole symmetry. It's a gas spectrum. Okay? But I have edge modes, two fermions. I assume they're fermions, F1 and Fn, living on this edge here and here, that I'm now going to couple. Okay, by T end. So I have these fermions, they live, okay? F1 and Fn. And I haven't written them down to be exactly the fermions on these sides, C1 and Cn, because they can be dressed. Okay? They can be they can be, you know, a combination of C this can be a combination of Cn plus decaying things in the bulk. It's a gap system, so we know that that's the only thing that it can do. <coughs> okay, so now I'm going to couple them. What's the term that can couple them? So now I'm going to do this experiment. What's the term that can couple them? T end, this hopping end, times what? Someone. What? F1 dagger, Fn, Fn, plus emission conjugate. That's basically the only term. And I'm going to switch this from positive to negative. Right? I'm going to make this experiment. Okay? What does the ground state do? So everything is gapped here. So I just this, assume this gap is huge. So I'm just going to work in this small subspace of edge modes that are at zero energy. Okay? And split them. Make this experiment that I said in search flux. What is the ground state with Tn positive of this Hamiltonian? Come on. It's just diagonalizing the sigma x matrix, right? Because this is this is F1 dagger, Fn dagger, sigma x, F1, Fn, T end. Yeah? What's the ground? I got paid by the hour here. <laughs> What's the ground state? <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> The ground state is F1 dagger minus Fn dagger on zero. Now I insert flux pi, so T end becomes less than zero. What's the ground state now? 
Come on. Are these of different fermion parity? Do they have different fermion parity? No. They don't. But I know the fermion parity must change. Hence, these edge modes cannot be complex fermions. OK? They don't change. Well, these edge modes can be Majoranas. Why? That's the only alternative left. It's a one-body problem. OK? We don't have that many options. The only other one-body operator that we know, um, that we can write down, is a Majorana fermion. So if I had at the end now gamma 1 and gamma n with the property that gamma 1 dagger is equal to gamma 1 and gamma n dagger is equal to gamma n, which these didn't have that property, f1 dagger is not equal to f1. Okay? What's the Hamiltonian, and I now want to make this experiment, what's the Hamiltonian that I can write down that couples these edge modes? What is it? T end times? Thank you. Gamma 1, gamma n. And, and because um, of hermeticity, um, what do I need to add? If I add a permission conjugate, it would anti-commute, right? It would give me zero. So there's something other factor of i. Thank you. OK? This is a Hermitian Hamiltonian that couples these edge modes. So now let me see what the ground states of this are. Since I have gamma 1 dagger is equal to gamma 1, this is an operator that doesn't have its own Hilbert space, as was pointed out uh, very neatly yesterday. If it stands alone, I can't define state 0 with gamma 0 equals to 0, because gamma is equal to gamma dagger. So this is obviously nonsense. What I can do is do as was done in yesterday's talk, take two Majoranas and make a fermion, a complex fermion. So I can take these two Majoranas and make the fermion F, which is equal to gamma 1 plus I gamma N. This is a complex fermion. F dagger is not equal to F. It has a local Hilbert space. I can define a state 0, such that F on 0 is equal to 0, and a state 1, which is F dagger 0. OK? Let's look at this Hamiltonian. So gamma 1 is f plus f dagger over 2. Gamma n is f minus f dagger over 2i. I can do the algebra. And I'll get here t end f dagger f minus 1 half. OK? Now if t is positive, what's the ground state? If t end is positive, what's the ground state of this Hamiltonian? What is it? Yeah? It's got energy minus one half T. If T end is negative, so after flux insertion, what's the ground state of this Hamiltonian? F dagger zero or one. Do they differ by fermion parity? They do. Experiment done. So odd number, I've proven to you the statement that I've made before somewhere. That all number of bands is tantamounts to Majorana um, fermions. OK? So I, 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 for me, at least, the step from 1 to odd is completely obvious. From? So you prove it for 1, maybe. Right, OK. <laughs> mm. Thanks. So it must be true for all of them. Well, if I had, so, so, no, it's, so what, if I do this experiment, if I had another band, then, the fir then this is going to have another, mm -hmm. right? So if I add two bands, this is even. And I add another band here, this is even also. There's no change upon proximation in fermion parity. So I don't need to have Majorana modes. So that's, if I have odd, if I have the third one, I get another one, odd. And here, it's even. So with all number of bands, it's basically the fact that you've got this extra 
that you know upon shifting boundary conditions you go you've, you've got this extra zero by the way if you took the bandwidth to be opposite so if you took the minimum to be at pi and depending on n even or odd these would actually shift the periodic one would be even and the end but in the end that periodic one would be odd but there's always this shift no matter how you take the you know so you can you can say well here you took the bandwidth at zero whatever you want to take it at pi the moral of the story what's important is not that this is even and this is odd with fermion parity with odd number of bands I can make this odd I can make this even and this odd by just reshuffling things but but there is always a parity change if the Fermi level is uh, in the bandwidth of an odd number of bands and is it obvious that if I break reflection symmetry that I'm also going to change parity when I? It's not. It's not obvious, but you can make uh, you can make uh, you can make an, an argument for it. It's not. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very good. So all number of Majoranas has uh, all number of bands has uh, Majorana uh, has has Majorana modes at the end. And they would obviously appear as, as in a superconductor if you make a chain as these. Okay? Now what I want to next thing that I want to show you is some data and then we'll go next talk to well not some data. I want to show you how you realize this. And next talk we'll go and do the Z to Z8 interacting um, basically the breakdown from a non-interacting classification to an interacting classification and show you how you can actually hopefully experimentally um, get that. So, so basically how do we get an odd number of bands? So the cu crucial question is get an odd number of bands in a 1D thing. Well, there's been, you know, I, didn't, I don't have time to show you know, other people's data but um, there's been these um, you know, really kind of amazing proposals and experiments from um, you know um, um, Roman Luchin and Leo Kovenhoven and Yuval Oreg groups and uh, many others, uh, Patrick, etc., Patrick Leap and a lot of other people. They basically used spin orbit coupling to get the bands, to get an odd number of bands. So what they did is they took <coughs> they took the problem is right. I have I have electron spin always. So I have up and down this even number of bands. So this argument doesn't work. Okay. By the way, is it clear that if I have two Majoranas on the same edge, they can hybridize and move away, right? By the same, if I just had two of them here, I have a local Hilbert space here, and I could, with open boundary conditions, I could add gamma one, say I have gamma one, gamma two. I could add a term I gamma one, gamma two that breaks them. So that's why you want an odd number of bands. Also, um, in you know, this is in retrospect. Um, okay, so what they do is they use spin orbit coupling to do the following thing. Take this spin up, take this spin down. Okay? This is called the Rashba structure. So spin orbit coupling can do this. Okay, the shift them in momentum. This is energy versus momentum. Now there's an interesting point that of course you can now pair by S wave. You can pair left and right by S wave because this is spin up, this is this is spin down, this is spin up. So I can have a term delta which is constant, C K up, C minus K down, which if I don't have this spin label, this will give me zero, right? Is it clear that this gives you zero once you sum over K if you don't have the spin label? Yes. If you have spin orbit coupling, then why is K is a good It's 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 not. But but it's yeah. <laughs> it's not a good quantum number. The spin, <laughs> you know, forget, uh, you know, if there's still a good symmetry, if I, let's not get into that. The, the point is, because <laughs> I would have to write, I would have to write, I would have to write down Hamiltonian. <laughs> which I don't want to do. So, <laughs> so this is so the Hamiltonian for that is k squared. <laughs> Let's see. Right yeah. Five inches of board. That's right. So this Hamiltonian is k squared over two n. Um, c up dagger c up da c up plus c down dagger c down. Okay. 
plus, since it's a one-dimensional thing, the spin orbit coupling I can write it down as k, okay, times sigma z, I pick a matrix, okay, c up dagger, c down dagger, c up, c down. Okay, this is a perfectly well-defined spin orbit coupling. It's time reversal invariant because this flips, this is spin flips, it is in some basis written down. So you notice that you still have an SZ symmetry, right? You've broken the full SC2, but you still have an SZ symmetry in this case. So that's what I mean. There's, in more complex cases, I mean even something different, but in this case, this is what I mean. Okay? Does that make sense? Good. Okay. But <coughs> notice that if I um, put my Fermi level here, I always have an even number of bands. So I, just by doing spin orbit counting, I haven't done anything to, these, to, these, to the band. I still have an even number, so my arounds are still not guaranteed. However, I can now add a magnetic field. This is all in this basis, C up dagger, C down dagger. I can now add a magnetic field on the x direction, say, okay? And this breaks this cream of degeneracy. This is the degeneracy you see at k equals to zero. This term is inefficient, okay? And this term is also inefficient. So there's a degeneracy which is, you know, just given by, it's really more, you know, it's more generic than this. It's just given by time reversal. But this magnetic field obviously now breaks it because at k equals zero, I still have this Hamiltonian, which has two energies, plus and minus b. So this is a gap of order 2b, okay? So now I can put this Fermi level somewhere here and just get one band at the Fermi level. Now there's, a, there's not a problem, so this is what Leo Kogenhoff's experiments do. There's no problem with this. There's the issue that we were confronted with is, or that actually they are confronted with also, is that you've got a superconductor, you've got to proximitize to get a gap here. You've got a magnetic field that you need to add on. And this gap is small, induced by the magnetic field. You can't add a huge magnetic field on a superconductor. And, and this gap, uh, hence, is limited. Now, notice that the phase space for topological superconductivity, by which I mean the phase space, the region of parameters for which the number of bands is odd, is exactly this magnetic gap. Because if I'm sitting, no, let's make it like this. If I'm sitting here, I have an even number of bands crossing the Fermi level, and I won't get my Aranas. So this is the phase space for topological superconductivity, and it's small. So what you want to do is you want to kind of get away from that limit. You want to make that phase space large. And there's a very simple way of making that phase space large. And that simple way is to use magnetic atoms. So you can make that phase space large by putting, you know, I don't know, you know, huge amount of Teslas on it, 90 Tesla, whatever, 20 Tesla, but then you destroy a superconductor. So <coughs> the moral of the story is just add, add this time reversal breaking, this B magnetic field only where it matters. So don't add it everywhere on the superconductor. It's useless. It only matters to add it on the chain, okay? So, because that's where you want on this on this on this chain that's going to have my runs, so because that, that's where you want to where you want to have the effect. So then you immediately realize that what you have to use is ferromagnetic atoms, because if I make a chain of a ferromagnetic atom on top of a superconductor, then you know if the ferromagnetism is strong and in iron it's of the order one electron volt, the J, or even more, uh, the order electron volts then your spin up and spin down bands of this wire are immediately spin split. And as the question before uh, pointed out, once they're immediately spin split, since any orbitals that I'll, that I'll have, um, you know, the, 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 the number of states is of orbital angular momentum on 2L plus 1, that's always odd. So unless you're like completely half filled here, Okay? You're always going to have an odd number of bands at the Fermi level as long as the bands are spin split. So you're. Well, you do the experiment, you're willing to avoid any domain walls without 
Yeah, so somehow the, the, the chains, the, I'll show you, the, the chains are short enough that domain will, so you know, the chains are 200 uh, atoms long. Mm -hmm. So, so, so now so I'll show data, yeah. So they're short enough that you don't have. It's very good. Thank you for that question. So <coughs> the other thing is that. Ah, very good. That's a great question. So, so this, so those my, so these chains also have a, a, a fundamental uh, advantage in the sense that the Majoran localization length is four atoms long or five atoms long. The reason for that is the the Fermi velocity is heavily renormalized in this in these um, in these cases. So, you know. The Fermi velocity over the gap is roughly the, the localization of the Majorana. So the, the Fermi velocity is heavily normalized because the band has to renormalize to sit in the gap. So then you go from here to something like this. So that makes, so I'll show, so I'll show the, okay. And also what you can do is you can take, you know, you can do atomic, uh, you, can do, you can basically manipulate atoms, pick them, atomic manipulation, pick them from one side, put them to another, and create different shapes. Okay. So basically what I wanted to point out is that there's actually two regimes of creating, of creating topological superconductivity. First of all is it's, you've got this, this um, uh, um, you know, ferromagnetic chain sitting on top of the superconductor to give you the superconducting delta. Now why do you need in this case spin orbit coupling and you do need spin orbit coupling is because the superconductor is S wave. So if I just had a ferromagnetic chain with these bands that you saw before, so say like I have just these bands that are, you know, spin up and spin down, and I try to proximitize this with an S wave, that would be highly inefficient. I couldn't open a gap because this would be delta. They're both spin up. Delta C up, dagger C up, dagger K minus K, and this would be zero because the quantum number. But now if you ask, if you have if the system has spin orbit coupling, then these spins are, you know, not exactly parallel, and you can induce proximity effect, as I'll show. Okay, so this is the situation that we'll be looking at. Although there's this other situation where the spin can form a spiral, that is, this one will be efficient for braiding. This one will not for braiding schemes, as, as I'll show. But we haven't found yet a system in, well, Ali hasn't found yet a system that does this. There's the reports from these German groups that, that there are some systems that have a spiral, but all the systems that we have have a superconductor. Okay. The last thing that I want to show you is a bit of physics uh, before I show you some, some, some data and ask, well, really what I've told you so far is, you know, spin orbit coupling, um, um, magnetic field, but what we have in this system are actually just impurities, just iron impurities, which have a magnetic moment, okay? So they just have some magnetic moment. And I want to ask, what do these impurities do in a superconductor? There's no real magnetic field, there's just a magnetic moment of the iron. And this introduces the concept of Shiba states. So what an impurity does in a superconductor is very similar to what I showed you there. If you take an impurity of strength um, um, J, okay, so this is Js impurity, which is iron, times the spin of the electrons in the superconductor at the position of the impurity. This is the interaction Hamiltonian plus H superconductor. So what this impurity does is, if you increase this J, is it also causes a phase transition in the superconductor where the ground state parity also changes, just like in that case. So let me show you that. That's very easy to understand just from a single <coughs> particle model without the superconductor, just as I did here. I start without the superconductor, prove parity change, and then add the superconductor and say that that has to be the case because the superconductor doesn't change adding superconducting order parameter doesn't change the parity. So I'm going to model my impurity. You can do a lot better, but I'm going to model my impurity just to a single site with a magnetic field B. Small magnetic field just means the 
the magnetic moment of the impurity. And in this side, as I crank up B, B is this J, you can immediately see that the one side problem has a phase transition. And this phase transition is if B is less than mu, both spins are occupied of this, of this impurity up and down. And it's a doubly occupied state. But if B is greater than mu, then this has lower energy, and I just have a singly occupied state. So as I crank up the J of the impurity, I'll have a transition between an even and an odd fermion parity um, um, state. Hence, there's got to be states coming down and crossing, right? Because these are good quantum numbers. But now if I have a gap, if my superconductor has a, has a gap, and since I've added just one impurity at one point, then there must be in-gap states. The states that cross have to be in-gap. This is the gap of the superconductor here. The states that cross, which have to cross, because I know if I crank up B, I go from even to odd. Um, the states that cross must be in-gap states, and those are called Shiba states. So impurities have Shiba states. Magnetic impurities have Shiba states associated to them. Okay? And this was, you can do a more complex calculation that I don't want to show. But basically, what you can show is that you add to the superconductor an impurity spin. And you find out this is the superconducting density of states. But these are the Shiba states coming in. And at some point, when this J is large, pi times the density of states times J times S is 1 of order 1, then, then there's a crossing. And that crossing is just a fermion parity change. Okay. And these have been discovered early on. This is data on Shiba states in, on gadolinium atoms. <coughs> the background, the superconducting background is removed. So you don't see the density of states. This is the gap. You don't see this density of states above the gap. You don't see you know, these things. These things have been removed by measuring the same density of states at some other point away from the impurity. And these are the Shiba states. These are the peaks that come in um, inside the gap. And this is how they vary away from where the impurity was. Okay. So now what happens if I add these? So this for one impurity, one magnetic impurity. But now I add a lot of these magnetic impurities in a chain. Well, these Shiba states that are in the gap will hybridize and form bands. Okay? So this system is really formed out of Shiba bands. You know, it's akin to this system but much more complicated. It's formed out of Shiba bands. And <coughs> you can do a realistic calculation with you know, lead parameters, etc. And look for the phase space of topological superconductivity. This is versus the angle. This is this is some angle of iron if iron makes a zigzag pattern on the surface, which it actually does. And you find so all the all the all the um, um, uh, dark regions are topological superconductors. So you find a large topological superconductor space, just as I argued before. But this is a more complex calculation, and there should be Majorana mode at the ends of the chain. Okay. So here's how the density of states would look in a calculation. This is not an entirely realistic calculation. The density of states as you're coming in, you're trying to probe it with an STM. You're coming in. There's the zero bias peak, which is at the end. Then you've got Shiba states left and right here. Okay, these are Shiba states. The gap is somewhere here. This is subtracted, but the, the full superconducting gap is somewhere here. These are Shiba states here, and 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 at the end of the wire, there should be as I get to the end, there should be one localized Majorana mode, which is this one which as you go inside the wire disappears. OK? If you made a circle, yeah. you only get the Shiva states on right. That's right. That's right. So, but I can do in a circle if I have, so I'll show that. That's a very good question. So, in the Shiva state, so if I do a circle and I have a helix instead of ferromagnet, I can add a magnetic field in plane. So this is what we're trying to do, basically. I can add a magnetic field in plane, and that breaks the circular symmetry of the circle. And that creates four Majoranas. That they can create a boundary because between trivial and non-trivial. It creates four Majoranas. And by just twisting the field like this, you can move the Majoranas around. If you just 
added magnetic field, you can move them around and you keep your STM tip fixed, move the field, and you see the Majorana shuffling through the ST. So that's, but um, you're certainly right. If I just make a circle, I would hybridize these end Majoranas and I would just get the Shivas. <coughs> okay, so this, um, I want to show you something. How much more time have I got? Like five minutes? Um, we started a couple minutes late, so at least five. Okay. okay. So, so I just. Yeah, I mean, it's really, you see, like all these are simplified pictures. It's really kind of a hybrid structure, so I can't entirely, I mean, the Shiba physics does tend to be very important, as I'll, as I'll show, but I can't just, yeah, it's, 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 it's really kind of an intermediate range coupled structure, so I can't really, you know, so Felix von Oppen, and Leonis Glassman like to get rid of, uh, just think of the Shiva states. But so, while that's an, that's you know that's that's nice in order to make a, a picture of it, um, the situation is much more complicated. The energy scales are basically the same. Uh, no, nothing is small. Nothing is. <laughs> they're all you know. What are the energy scales? The so, Shiva state are result of the your ferromagnetic atoms being magnetic. Right. So the J of the magnet. This is something that didn't exist in the. the Wire. That's right, that's right. So, because there I have a magnetic field. So, right. so, so, you know, the J of the iron is a border of one to two electron volts. Mm -hmm. Now, the gap of lead is, you know, one point uh, five mil electron volts. So you're trying. To, so all these Shiba states are in that gap. So you, you know, you're trying to get from physics of that, you know, the hopping of iron from one hopping to another is a border of half an electron volt. So all those scales. So you're trying to get from scales of electron volts down to the Shiba state scales of you know within 1.5 mil electron volts. So so those are so that's the type of so that's why I'm saying that nothing you know the hopping matrix elements in in lead are of order electron volts. So all the iron and all the all the all the exchange and all the hoppings are of order um, electron volts, and you're trying to get the physics. Inside the gap, which is of order mi electron volts. But does, does the band structure of iron net and mean does the kinetic energy matter? I mean, <coughs> it matters because if it wasn't, you know, if the iron was just very far apart. You wouldn't get the end. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But do you have evidence of there being a uh, coupling, hopping? Yes, yes. What is that? I mean, there's, yeah, so there's, so, 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 you know, you can, well, you have. You know, you have simulation evidence, so you can actually you can you can see that there's basically if there wasn't coupling, I wouldn't see one wouldn't see the Majorana, and also like uh, also the you know the the ab initio has and and also the distance between the irons is roughly the same distances between lead atoms, so there's got to be some. Okay. Yes. So, so this Shiba state, what uh, I mean, for certain uh, band of this Shiba state, it has some uh, spin up, and the other is spin down. Or no, these are all spin. Um, well, these are the transition uh -huh. is in between a unoccupied state, if I have just one Shiba state, and an up state or whatever the J is. So basically, it's just like you crank up J, and this impurity binds an up electron on it. Okay, so the Shiba state, the the so the so the the transition there was between, you know, unoccupied say or, and here it's like spin up with this was spin up for example. Okay. So they, the, so all of these Shiba states actually have spin. Okay. So let me, so let me show you how. So I'm, I just want to show you some data before I leave because I not. I want to go to, you know, more blackboard theory next. So <coughs> what you do is well, not what I do, but what you, what what Ali Azani does is he sputters iron on top of lead substrate, and sometimes this iron, the lead has got. It's a particular surface of lead, which is anisotropic, okay? Like the 110. So you've got ridges that go in one direction, 
and you find out that sometimes, you know, I don't know, 30% of the time, something like that, the iron that comes out of these blobs comes out of in these ridges and makes 1D wires, okay? And these wires are given there. The reason why they're always in the same direction, you won't see a wire like this or a wire like this, is because, um, you know, there's, it's a specific surface which is anisotropic. All right, so <coughs> there's typical length of the wires around 100 angstroms. You find sometimes longer ones, so that's basically, um, you know, uh, 50, 60 atoms until the blob. You find sometimes 200 angstroms, those are really long wires. Okay, the blob is where it all started from. They're single atom wide, so you know that they're actually single atom wide, the topography image. And, and if you do, you know, if you look at, so the message of this slide is that we understand the lead substrate very well. See, you know, this is the theoretical matching of, you know, the STM data to the BCS fit with the lead band structure of a gap. And you can, away, this is away from the wires, okay? So now, <coughs> what we want to do is prob probe the magnetic structure of the wires. And so you can, when you have STM, you can take data with different types of tips. You can take data with normal tip, you can take data with magnetic tip, and you can take data with superconducting tip. All of which have been taken in this experiment. So this is magnetic tip. And with magnetic tip, you're basically probing whether the iron chain is magnetized or not, because if, you, if your tip is up and your iron is up, you'll be able to tunnel into it. If your tip is up and the iron is down, you won't be able to tunnel into it. And this is what you find. You find that this is the topography of, this is, this is where the wire was when you do it without magnetized, without a magnetized tip, then apparently the way you do these experiments is you take your tip, you, you crush it into into the blob of, of, of iron to get like some you know, magnetic moment on it. You raise it again and you do this experiment again with magnetic tip now. And, and you can clearly see that you can tunnel into up but not into down. There's a small modulation here but not essential. So this immediately proves that, that the spins are up. Also you can... Is the color saying that it yeah, the color is like high. See the red? Yeah, the red is high tunneling uh, um, um, current, basically measuring current. This other, right? So, also the other thing that was 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 um, was um, um, tried is magneto resistance on the surface, and I can talk about it later. But that basically proves that there's strong spin orbit coupling in the surface, which we knew because lead has spin orbit coupling of order 0.6 electron volts. That's a different type of spin orbit coupling, but there's, there's strong spin orbit coupling in the surface. Okay, so this is the data. What you find as you go, so now you take the wire and you go across. I want to take like two minutes and, or three minutes and finish the, the data. You cross the tip, across the wire here at the end. This is the initial data, I don't know, two years ago. And you can clearly see that now there will be something at zero. This left is a Shiba state here. This is the gap of the lead. This is a Shiba state here. But notice what's happening here. Wow. OK? You can clearly see the appearance of a zero bias signal as you cross the edge. OK? Now. This is data taken from both sides. Okay, from one side you can clearly see as I go through the end that there's a zero bias peak, which just appears. Okay? And from this data you can also see now that, or at least now on my screen, that there's a zero bias peak that disappears as I go inside the bulk of the wire. So you can kind of plot this on a color scheme, and this is looking at different energies, tunneling current basically, and you can see the zero, at zero energy, there's a spatially localized thing at the end. Okay? What you can also do is kill superconductivity and do the same experiment without superconductivity. 
This is with superconductivity on the left side. You can clearly see the zero bias peak here. And these are Shiba states. What? The dip is a Shiba state? No. This is a Shiba state. So why is it part of uh, energy asymmetry? Oh, uh, that's, that's always, you always have, uh, an, uh, you always have an energy asymmetry. Basically, the, the locally, the constraint is that, the constraint is that the spectrum is particle of all symmetry if you integrate over the full uh, sample. So if I go to other sides of the sample, it'll, you know, they'll have more weight on the, lower side, but locally if I just do C of X uh, or C dagger of X, they don't have to, it's just basically one of them computes the U factor, the other one the V factor, which they don't need to be the same in the Bogolivov. Okay, and then you kill the superconductivity with a magnet, an actual applied magnetic field and you see nothing in the signal as you go across the, the transition. Let me just see if I can actually show you this. Okay. All right, yeah, so this is, while killing superconductivity, nothing happens. Okay, and the last thing that I wanted to show you, if this is, okay, is that there's now three groups that repeated the experiment. So this is the original data two years ago at 1.4 Kelvin. But there's now two different groups that repeated the same experiment. This data was taken with both, you know, normal magnetic and superconducting tip. Um, these groups basically just have magnetic tip, but um, they've taken it at you know slightly lower energy resolution uh, energy scale. This is 1.4 Kelvin. This is 1.1 Kelvin, and you see the same. You know, I guess this this group has increased the contrast quite a bit, <laughs> but 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 there's now data from uh, two other groups that that support the zero bias peak. And the ultimate last thing that I want to show you in terms of data, and then I want to show you next. Uh, I want to show you how you can implement projective representations in this system in the next lecture is new data so all these so this this data was taken at at you know 1.1 Kelvin is the most recent published data lower than the you know original 1.4 but now there's data at 250 millikelvin on the same system so basically what you're trying to see is you're trying to see this zero mode that's at the end splits or not. So the zero mode could be just, you know, one Majorana or it could be two Majoranas with a small splitting T between them or a small coupling between them. So the name of the game as, 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 as of now is to bound that possible splitting. Of course you go to zero temperature and see that it doesn't split then it is just one Majorana, right? <coughs> so now 250 millikelvin, the resolution is much better. The zero bias peak is still here. You can clearly see it. These are Shiba states. There's actually like a, a hell of a lot of them because you've got 5D orbitals. Each of them has its own Shiba state, etc. And the splitting of the zero bias peak is less than 45 micro electron volts. So uh, this will be published later. So your blue line uh -huh. is not supposed to have zero bound peak. It, the bias peak, right? Am I right? Yeah, the blue line, this, this blue line is somewhere here. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, if I wanted to make a case, I would take the best data that shows nothing at zero energy yeah. for the blue. Um, if I mean, you the don't. Best yeah. you have, well, this is mid-chain. <laughs> this is average. So basically, the way you look. So if you want to look at it on on here, this is how you you know. This this is this is a topography along the chain. Uh -huh. This gives you like you know, chain resolution and energy resolution, and you kind of see that you've got the Shiva state bands here, and then immediately removed from the Shiva state bands. There's an, you know. You, can, uh, you could ask whether you know, this is just an edge effect where you curve this zero bias peak is an edge effect. Where you, first of all, if it was just an edge effect, it would split. But you can also see it in a topography that's completely removed from the Shiva bands here. Mm -hmm. right? So, so uh, this white figure with the yeah. high resolution, uh, you said they're all Shiva states. So when I move away from the edge, everything stays except the middle peak that's high. So Shiba, the Shiba states do, um, um, yeah, so I mean, 
the Shiba states towards, you know, as I move away from from from, from, yeah. from the edge, they well they they just they, I mean basically there are there are edge effects in the Shiba states, cause, you know, but but the, this one completely disappears. These ones there's you know there's um, there's there the Shiba states are influenced by 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 termination effects, etc. So, well, you can. This is quantitative modeling. You can model these, but you know you only have you know. Maybe, maybe I guess the, the yeah. question is, you know, just a simple slab of copper has surface states. Not only topologically they have surface states. There's something distinguishing between just you know good old surface state of that. So we know that if we go, so what, what one can do is go and do the same experiment away from the wire. Mm -hmm. And then I, sh I showed that there's just this really you know, good old BCS gap. It's got nothing. So if it's got surface states, they're totally gapped. It might have. No, 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 no. I, I'm talking about the end. So right. you mentioned that the Shiva state themselves yeah. have, are aware of the geometry that they're. Their, right. Their end of the wire. Yeah. So that is my analog of you know, surface state. Right. Power, right. So there's a Shiva state, end state, end state of having to do with the Shiva states, knowing that you know my array is ending, and then there is you know my arena thing, which is fuller. And, yeah. Um, Hopefully. Can you tell them apart? In a, you know, what would be the best way to tell them apart? So, so the best way to tell them apart is that you know the the Mayarana would be at zero energy. The Shivas generically don't need to be so if you know if I go to zero that's why I show data at 250 millikelvin mm -hmm. uh, if I go all the way to zero energy and it doesn't split then it's certainly a Majorana because mm -hmm. I don't you know now this so now this is the splitting bound that's what I, I you know which is the same bound that you find in these nanowires by the way I'm surely also you could look for unusual properties having to Oh yeah, I mean, so you, so we're trying to, you know, I mean, braiding is what we're trying to do, but that's <laughs> going to, you know, Maybe we'll let braid after. <laughs> but that's going to be hard. So yeah, so um, there's other properties in terms of spin that we're looking at that could actually prove whether it's a Majorana or not. It's got a, the, the, certainly the Majorana has a unique spin structure that would, but but yeah. Anyway, so okay, so I'll, next slide I'll show you how to next next talk I'll show you how to compute projective representations in this system. Okay, so thanks. Okay, so we had a lot of questions during the talk and we're a bit behind, but maybe we should take take uh, one more from a, from a student. There's a student question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, does this does a picture change if the uh, iron were well, like in a spiral state? And then the related question is you said the orbit coupling is important, in which case I would normally expect the DM hyper parameters typically gives a spiral. So why are they not seen? Right, so 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 iron usually is ferromagnetic. So so if I but yeah, I, you know, you're right. Some uh, spiral should spirals should exist. And as you, you know, I, I, I think allude to it, spirals basically are the same as spin orbit coupling. So if I had a spiral, I wouldn't need a superconductor with strong spin orbit coupling. So I could, you could, you could add it on a superconductor that doesn't have spin orbit coupling. So that's the that's the advantage of of a spiral. And there's advantages to braiding if I have spirals because I can actually, you know, I can put these I can put these uh, systems. On in a circle and or in like ellipses as I'll show, and then you can braid with them. But so far, I don't think there's any evidence oh, for oh, spirals. Oh. Certainly not in iron. Okay. So if you could yeah. disconnect from yeah. the yeah. Here. I don't think I'll bring the screen down. Yeah, you want this. Okay, let's uh, thank Andre again.